I have the Reverend Charlie Garrett come on up. So thankful for his ministry here as he teaches the many Bible studies and the Sunday school classes and even the uh, church on the beach that he does every week. We, he's a blessing to us and, and uh, just thankful for him. And uh, share with us this morning. Is this on? It is on. Last time I got introduced by Seth and he gave me this beautiful introduction like Jared. And I just turned around and started speaking because I was so nervous. And so I apologized to him later. And I've preached on abortion at the Boston Commons. And it is easier to do that than to preach in front of Seth and Jared and Mike, who are exceptional at what they do. So my hat is off to them. They've done a great job over the past year. And uh, my heart is touched by you guys. Today we're going to talk about eternal salvation despite ourselves. If you read 1 Kings chapter 10, you'll see the story about the death of the king of Ammon. King David had sent ambassadors to the funeral to show his respect, but the new king's advisors said this, Do you think that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Has not David rather sent his servants to you to search the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow it? Therefore Hanun took David's servants, shaved off half their beards, cut off their garments at the middle, at the buttocks, and sent them away. When they, when they told David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, wait at Jericho until your beards have grown, and then return. David let these guys slide while their beards grew back. Unfortunately, I don't have a king to pay my way in life until I'm handsome again. And so the lesson is to keep your beard away from something spinning at 4,000 RPM, okay? <laughs> Today we are going to review 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It contains a verse that along with Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, I often use for supporting and defending the doctrine of eternal salvation. In the verse in Ephesians, it says this, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The seal carries the weight, the authority, and the power of the one to whom that seal belongs. In the case of me, if I were to seal a document, a third grader could open it up without much problem, and in fact, if I protested, I might get beaten up. If something is sealed by the Sarasota County government, then you're liable to prosecution under Sarasota County for breaking that seal, such as on an unpaid water meter. Should someone attempt to break the seal on the lion's den in which Daniel was in, they would incur the wrath and the penalty of the Persian king. Certainly death, and probably in the same lion's den. In each case, the seal bears the authority and the irrevocability of the one who is responsible for that seal. In the case of the sealing of the Holy Spirit, as there is no greater force in the entire universe, eternal salvation is assured. And I'd like to thank Bob Olry for that particular insight. My own thoughts on Ephesians 1.13 may seem a little bit more perverse, but they come to the same end. Should God, who is all-knowing, seal us with the Holy Spirit and then revoke that seal, it would do two things. It would show first God's incompetence in the matter because he made a mistake in the first place. That's something that would be impossible. And secondly, it would show that God has reneged on his own deal, his own guarantee, as it says, the guarantee of our inheritance. Again, that's impossible. So whether we can or whether we cannot lose our salvation is not a minor issue. And it is a huge dividing line between denominations. If you are a preacher who is trained under Wesley or Arminius, then you have tra been trained in a theology that says that you can lose your salvation. That would be uh, Methodism, the Church of God, etc. Those, those particular denominations. If you follow Roman doctrine, which you'll find right next door, then your eternal state is basically up to the church. But if you hold to what this church proclaims, then you believe rightly, based on the Bible, that you cannot lose your salvation. Only one option is true, and that is the biblical one. 
From the Grace Baptist Statement of Faith, we read these words. The substitutionary atonement and bodily resurrection of Christ. We believe the Lord Jesus Christ was willingly put to death on a cross and buried. But after three days, he rose from the dead and then ascended into heaven. Hallelujah for that part. Where he now sits at the right hand of the Father. As such, his death fully paid the death penalty for our, that our sins demanded. So that all who believe in him are declared righteous, sealed with the Holy Spirit who enables right living, and are forever reconciled to God. Because of the importance of this doctrine, eternal salvation, and a side issue, which is completely tied up in it, today I'm going to be speaking to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with a very long diversion into James chapter 2. Here's our text verse for today. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. So may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. Chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians opens with these unhappy words. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Paul was rightfully distraught about the behavior, not only of the individual, but also the behavior of the entire congregation. They were fully aware of what this person was doing, and as we'll see in a minute, they did nothing about his actions. What this man was doing may not have been named among the Gentiles, but it does harken back to another unhappy account for the person and the people of Israel, the covenant people of God. In the book of Genesis, we read the following. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Adair. And it happened when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn son, and he lived an unstable life. If you know the account of Israel, he had two wives through marriage, and then he had two other women, his wives' maidservants, who bore him children based on a rivalry between the two wives. The 12 sons born to these four women became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names are Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Reuben, being the eldest of them, should have inherited the birthright. But because of his actions, the birthright was given to the two sons of Joseph, who were Ephraim and Manasseh. When Israel blessed his twelve sons before his death, this is what he had to say to Reuben, to his eldest. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might in the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Years and years after the fact that he had done this, the painful memory of what Reuben had done still haunted Israel, even as he lay dying. With his last breath to his son, he brought it to the memory of the entire clan who came from him, and to this day it is recorded in God's word to mankind. Like Reuben, the person that we're speaking about in 1 Corinthians would suffer because of his actions. Instead of a loss of a birthright, it would be excommunication from the fellowship and being handed over to the affliction of Satan. Now, maybe some of you know somebody, a Christian, who is engaged in inappropriate behavior. And so the question for you is, are you willing to take this person and hand him or her over to the affliction of Satan? Or maybe it's one of you that's living outside of God's word. Are you personally ready to be handed over to the affliction of Satan? I can't tell you how many Christians that I know that are engaged in immoral behavior, God's name is on them, and they will continue to suffer the affliction of the devil until they wise up. As it says in Proverbs, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And that brings us to point number two today, which is the church dysfunctional. How many of you right here have been in a dysfunctional church. I have uh, a lot of hands out here. Did you like it? I can tell you I can't personally think of anything that I would rather get away from other than my personal troubles than a church which is filled with gossip and 
backbiting and envy and strife. There's just nothing worse than that. And this is exactly what the Corinthian church was like. In addition to the other areas where they were weak, we read in chapter 5 regarding their knowledge of the man living in sin. And are you puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you? For indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, I have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't mean to leave you hanging at that particular verse and right in the middle of it at that. We'll finish our thought on that at the end of the day. But what he says after this bears heavily on the doctrine of eternal salvation. In the portion that we just read, though, Paul takes a moment to rebuke the Corinthians for their outright boasting. When he wrote, you were puffed up, he must have wondered if anything that they had done after their proclamation of, yes, Jesus is Lord, had gone into their lives. Okay, so now I'm saved and I can do whatever I want. But Paul warns that there are consequences. Both Paul and all of the writers of the New Testament warn of the consequences of sin. And they warn because sin has consequences. But one thing that they don't do ever is attempt to snatch back the salvation that is granted by the Lord Jesus. You're not going to find that in the Bible because salvation is eternal. We are saved despite ourselves. But the results of sin should be obvious to each one of us. If we return to drinking, maybe our health or maybe our, our liver will suffer. If we return to sexual immorality, we might catch herpes or we might catch AIDS or maybe we'll get shot by a jealous husband. If we lie, of course we're going to lose the respect of the person that finds us lying. And if we kill somebody, our own life may be forfeit by the state that judges us. And the list goes on. Sin is sin. And sin has consequences for our bodies, for our relationships, and even for our lives. As Paul says, I have already judged. By the power of Christ in him, Paul made a judgment as to the nature of the punishment necessary for the offense which had taken place, which is coming up a little bit later. But that brings us to point number three today, which is a little yeast goes a long way. San Francisco sourdough bread. And I say that in that way because just saying those words makes my mouth water. Imagine how many times practicing this sermon my mouth is watered. My wife knows if she takes and heats up 10 pieces of bread with dinner, I'm just going to eat the bread. I won't eat anything else. I love bread. And San Francisco sourdough bread is probably the most famous bread made in America today and even possibly in the entire world. What San Francisco produces has remained in continuous production for nearly 150 years. Some bakers, bakeries, such as the Boudin Bakery, are able to trace their starters all the way back to California's territory period. A starter is a piece of bread which is cut off out of the dough and it's left out of the baking process. And the next day when they make the new batch of dough, they throw in the piece from the previous day. It's called the starter. This single piece of dough contains all of the yeast for the entire batch of new dough. In the case of the Bu Din Bakery, they have been using the same initial yeast that was put in for over 150 years. Day by day, cut off a piece and save it for tomorrow. Cut off a piece and they'll save it for tomorrow. And then they'll cut off a piece and they'll say, this one's for tomorrow. And the question that comes to my mind is, what happens to the guy that forgets to cut off a starter for the next day? Get Donald Trump down here. You're fired, right? Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet, I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of the 
world, or with the covetous, or with the extortioners, or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. Paul said here, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? He then goes on to say that we are a new lump, truly unleavened. If you understand the symbolism from the Old Testament, Paul is equating leaven, or yeast, with sin. Yeast makes bread rise up. It puffs up. And sin makes our egos and our pride to puff up. And this is exactly what was occurring in the person and in the church. And are you puffed up, he asks? We need to understand that because we have moved from Adam to Christ, we take on his very nature. We move from being a sinful being to a being that is positionally sinless in Christ. And Paul says that we should act as if it's the case. Not to live in sin, despite it being the case. In order to get this through to them, he says, let us keep the feast. Again, he returns to Old Testament symbolism. And he says this after telling us that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. If you journey back to Leviticus chapter 23, you'll read these words. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. The Passover pictured Christ's cross and our redemption from sin, his work on our behalf. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which follows it, pictures the sinless life that we should live in him because of his work on our behalf. But this is the Feast of the Lord. We are to observe the Feast to the Lord based on what he did, not on what we did or what we do. And this bears heavily on a problem that is found in James chapter 2. As I said earlier, James 2.24 plays an intricate role in understanding or misunderstanding our position in Jesus Christ and whether salvation is eternal or not, or if we can ever know if we truly are saved. And that brings us to point number four today, which is works versus faith. Is getting saved like growing a beard? You grow the beard, and then you actually have to keep it out of the way of high-speed rotating parts in order to keep it. And let's hope not, because as I found out about two months ago, you can lose your beard very, very quickly. So we would hope that salvation is not the same. What I'm going to talk about right now deals with an apparent contradiction between Paul and James in two of the most difficult verses in the entire Bible. Taken individually, they are not difficult, but when you put them side by side, they produce a mountain of misunderstanding and a dump truck full of debate. Justification is the term the Bible uses for being declared not guilty. We are declared righteous by God based on an action and we move from a point of being guilty to a state where we are free from guilt. Our theology here at Grace Baptist, based on the Bible, says that this occurs the moment a person puts his trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone and nothing else is to be added to it. He tells us that our concerning justification here, Paul states, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. That's Romans 3.28. And then he says that our faith and our faith alone in what Jesus has done is what justifies us apart from any deeds. However, what James says seems on the surface to conflict with Paul's idea of justification by faith alone. Here's what he says. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Paul says a man is justified by faith, and James says that a man is justified by what he does, and not only faith. So which is it? If it is by what he does, then the obvious question for each person sitting here is, what is it that he does that justifies a man? Either there is a contradiction in these two verses, or James is speaking on exactly the same matter on an entirely 
different level. Paul is very clear when he states his stand of faith on his stand of justification on faith alone, and he repeats it four more times in the epistles. He says it in Romans 5.1, in Galatians 2.16, in Galatians 3.11, and in Galatians 3.24. In addition to this, his letters allude to the concept of justification by faith alone again and again and again. And even the very words of Jesus support justification by faith alone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So based on the James problem, Martin Luther has strong and disapproving words for the book of James. In his preface to the September Testament, which is his translation of the New Testament into German, he writes this. In a word, St. John's Gospel in his first epistle St. Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and St. Peter's first epistle are the books that show you Christ and teach you all that is necessary and salvatory for you to know, even if you were never to see or hear any other book or doctrine. Therefore, St. James' epistle is really a right straw epistle compared to these others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. Despite being one of the great theologians of Christian history, I simply have to disagree with Dr. Luther and with every other person that tries to find anything but faith and faith alone in what James is proclaiming. Since Luther's time, though, I want you to know that other peoples have struggled with the problem of James, and they have come to what I believe are dubious conclusions. Most biblical commentaries will either completely skip over James 2.24, or they will say that... that... Good works stem naturally from saving faith. In other words, their good works are the fruit of saving faith. And I can't tell you how many commentaries I've read that say this. One guy simply repeats what another person has thought of because they can't figure this problem out. Charles Ryrie, the great theologian from Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote this on this particular issue. This is from the Ryrie Study Bible on James 2.24. Unproductive faith is not genuine faith. Faith and works are like a two-coupon ticket to heaven. The coupon of works is not good for passage, and the coupon of faith is not valid if detached from works. I'd like you to tell that to the guy hanging on the cross next to Jesus sometime. Sorry, Charles, I love your name, but what you've said has completely missed the point, and you have abused what James has written. What Dr. Ryrie is saying is that if you have saving faith, you will naturally do good stuff. Therefore, the claim is that James is referring to this faith that he, you're demonstrating these works as the fruit of justification or the proof of your faith. Never mind that the Bible never says that. And because of looking at this particular verse in this light, many people will judge other people's actions based on what they do or what they do not do. The claim is that if there are no works, there is no saving faith. But there are two significant problems with that type of logic. First, non-Christians, non-Christians all over the world are actively doing good works. Many times these are equal to or better than the works of safe Christians. And even self-proclaimed atheists go out and do good stuff for other people. So these type of works simply cannot be what justifies us or proves our justification in any way, in any shape, or in any form. If they do, then these non-Christians have a right to look down on the Christians who don't do what they do and at the same level of output. And in fact, this is already the case because of the unhealthy living of many saved believers that don't do anything for Christ. Such as this guy that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And secondly, this does not align at all with what James is saying. James is saying that a man is justified by what he does. Not that justification is somehow proven by what he does. James is absolutely clear on what he is saying, and it takes a very bold pen to insert one's personal theology into such a clear statement. To say that James is saying that good works stem naturally from saving faith is to completely abuse the text as he's written it. 
Now, good works as a demonstration of salvation may be the biblical admonition. I don't dispute that at all. But it is not always the biblical norm. Here we are today about evaluating the book of 1 Corinthians, which is a book that is written to already saved believers. Paul never questions their salvation, even in the midst of gross immorality that is worse than the pagans. This church is the most disorganized, haphazard bunch of people that you could ever imagine. And good works are certainly lacking in the lives of these saved people. But they're saved. Hence, they are justified. If one pursues works as an evidence of true saving faith to its logical conclusion, then no amount of works could ever be enough to justify a person or to prove their justification. In other words, they would be in this never-ending cycle of fret as to whether they have appeased God enough in order to say, I feel justified. This is my faith. This is the dilemma that Martin Luther was actually caught in. He was a member of the Roman Catholic Church, and they completely controlled its adherence in regard to this. In essence, he was in complete bondage to the strict edicts and demands of the Catholic Church at that time. Because of this type of bondage, the extra-biblical teachings of depraved men will grow enormously in an environment like this. You're going to end up with things like indulgences and purgatory and prayers to the saints and adoration of Mary, working on the rosary, legalism of all types. All of this is the natural result of getting away from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says that we are saved by faith alone in the works of Jesus Christ. And this isn't unique to the Roman church either, because legalism and finger pointing over people that fail to cross the T's and to dot the I's will lead to dissatisfaction and disillusionment in any congregation. Charlie didn't wear polished shoes today. Well, guess what I did? Charlie's growing another beard. Charlie didn't wear a tie today. These are the kind of things that that leads to. The Roman Catholic Church, in its official canons from the Council of Trent in 1546, which are in full effect to this day, goes beyond Scripture. And its edicts would actually declare the Apostle Paul anathema in nine of its approved canons. Now, I'm not going to read all nine of them, but canon number nine bears heavily on the issue of justification, and it certainly finds its misunderstanding in James 2.24. Remember, this is in full effect to this day in the Catholic Church. Canon number nine. If anyone saith that the faith alone, by faith alone, the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. This is the very heart of Pauline doctrine, and yet it is called anathema by the Roman church. Paul the heretic. If this and the other official canons were true, then the message of eternal life through the work of Jesus Christ by faith alone would be false. Further, salvation would be entirely up to the determination of the church. But thanks be to God, however, that we are saved, we are justified, and we are glorified by the work of Jesus Christ alone, and nothing else needs to be added to it. Either the Bible or the church. Either the Bible church. You have to decide. And I tell you what, God already has. And so, and despite all of this, the apparent conflict between Romans 3.28 and James 2.24 remains unsolved. I just gave you those examples so that you can see how different churches and different individuals look at the problem that is presented by James. Our arbitrary works cannot be what resolve the dilemma between Paul and in what James said. And so the answer must not lie within us at all. Rather, the good works which justify us according to James must be as Jesus the Lord himself declared. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Here come my thoughts on James 2.24. Our continued faith in Jesus 
after saving faith in Jesus, becomes the work. Not a work of our own, but the work of Jesus. We believe in, have faith in Jesus and his earthly ministry, and we are justified, as Paul says in Romans. Our justification in what we do then, according to James, must be our faith in Jesus' work. His work on our behalf as mediator and advocate between God and man and the future promises which we are patiently waiting for. By necessity, it all must come back to Christ. And this is even confirmed in the second chapter of James, chapter 2. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete in what he did. Now, I know that sounds like works all of a sudden. Hold on. Paul states in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham was justified or declared righteous by faith. And then he cites Genesis 15 to prove it. James, in the quote that I just gave you, cites Genesis chapter 22. There are seven chapters and many years between the two accounts. And that is the declaration of righteousness made by God here back in Genesis 15. The Genesis 22 account, the works which James is citing, is explained in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up his son Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac shall your seed be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Do you see this? Abraham's faith, by faith, Abraham was made complete in what he did by demonstrating more faith in God. And this is the very work that James is citing. The deed is the faith in God's provision to bring Isaac back from the dead. So here's the question. Was Abraham righteous back in Genesis 15 or not? If he was, then he was saved. No matter what he did after that point, he was already declared righteous by God. We just simply need to think that through. From the first to the last, our declaration of justification is from and of Jesus Christ, what he did on our behalf. Our work justification, our faith in him and what he ha is doing and will do on our behalf. Now, one argument against this is that James later mentions Rahab the harlot. And when he does, he actually cites a work which justifies her. Well, does it? We're going to look at it together. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? You see, Charlie, James is citing a work. Rahab's work. No. Again, all we need to do is go right to uh, Hebrews chapter 15. Oh, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. The faith, again, is the work. Now, in this matter, I'd ask each of you to just think it through and to go ahead, evaluate what you hear, read commentaries, and then take them and check them against the only proper standard, which is the Holy Bible. But be sure that all good things do come from Christ. All good things belong to Christ, and all good things are by necessity of what he has done, he is doing, and he will do for us on our behalf. It is all about Jesus Christ and not about our obscure works. Quoting the Old Testament, the Old Testament, Paul says this, For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Old Testament and new, faith is what justifies the believer. So to sum all of this up, I want to give you a really quick example. I promised my daughter, Tangerine, that I am going to give her one million dollars in 20 years. I call this tangerine becomes a millionaire. If she says, oh, come on, dad, you're making that up. I'd obviously be completely disappointed in her, even angry. She's my daughter. She ought to know me better. Or maybe she knows me too well. I don't know. But suppose Jesus says, I am going to die on the cross, or I did die on the cross, and I will give you eternal life if you simply believe in it. And you say, come on, dad, or Jesus, I don't believe that. Same thing. He'd be completely disappointed in us. 
On the other hand, suppose Tangerine says that she believes me. However, after this, she keeps doing things to make sure that she believes me, kind of, but she doesn't want me to renege on the deal. I'd be completely disappointed in her. I'd say, Tangie, I've already told you I'm going to give you the 20 million or the million dollars in 20 years. Forget the 20 million, you don't get that. <laughs> That's the same thing as us working. Oh, I've got to do this to please God. And Jesus is saying, I've already done it. I did it at the cross of Calvary. You've got exactly the same thing going on. She's trying to buy my favor by doing things for me. Oh, here's an apple pie for you, Daddy. Tangie, I've already, I've already promised you I'm going to do this. On the other hand, suppose she says to everyone around her, my dad is giving me $1 million in 20 years. Let me share some of that with you now. That is true faith. It is faith in the promise that I made, and it is promise in the continued work that I am doing to ensure that that $1 million will be there for her in 20 years. Her actions are a mere demonstration of faith me. Not works to impress me, and not works to justify herself to me. And in the same way, her works did not stem naturally from saving faith, like all these commentaries would say. If I made the exact same promise to my son right over there, Thor, he would believe me completely from the first moment. I know, I know he would. But he would go about his life without doing anything at all about it, until the day I handed him the money, and then he'd go out to the mall, and he'd blow it all in one afternoon. I absolutely assure you of that. I call it Thor goes shopping. Everyone is different. What Tangerine did when he, she did those things, whether she did them for other people or not, would have no bearing on me at all. The promise was one-sided. The things that she did are entirely acts of faith in me in me and what I am doing for her, especially considering this, that if I didn't give her that money in 20 years, she would lose every single thing that she had given away, hoping that daddy was sincere. And is this any different than our faith and our works in Jesus Christ right now? If we are wrong about the Holy Bible, if we are wrong about the promises of Jesus Christ, then all the good stuff that we're doing is pointless. If we're wrong about what he did, all this Christmas stuff we're doing every year and all these thousands of man hours and the, the blood and the sweat and the dedication that Chuck and his wife put into this would be futile. It would be futile. By faith, Abraham offered up his son, Isaac. Do you think that it's a coincidence that James follows Hebrews and there are only three chapters between Hebrews 11 and James chapter 2? There's no mistake at all in God. So when we read the Bible, we need to remember what we have read as we move on to new passages and not insert our personal theology in the statements which we don't personally understand. Better to skip over them completely. Now I'd like to suggest a few ways that you can apply faith to your own life. First, have faith that God, through Jesus Christ, has done everything necessary to save you and to grant you eternal life. Two, have faith that this gift of God is eternal in nature. And that even if you've been let down by others, God is not a man that he should lie. You are safe in his salvation. Three, whatever you do, whatever you do is insufficient to save you or to keep saving you. So don't fret over whether your deeds are good enough or not. I assure you, they're not. Instead, whatever your deeds are, offer them to God the Father because of your love for Jesus Christ, his son. Four, if anyone points a finger at you because of who you are, like if you have a beard, or what you wear, or what you fail to wear, or what you do or fail to do that they don't approve of, then stand back, evaluate it based on the Bible. The Bible, check the Bible. If the Bible is silent on the issue, then you don't need to worry about their bony digit in your face. Five, Abraham was declared righteous by faith. God doesn't change, and he has or he will declare you righteous by that same faith. Have faith in that and have faith in his promises. And point number six, be offended at sin, both in yourselves and in others, and never let it get a foothold in your life. Should you falter, then confess it as sin and move on in the infinite grace 
of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Point number five today is saved despite himself. Deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Remember at the beginning of this talk I said that there's a verse in this particular chapter that I tie in with Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. This is it. Paul never questions this man's salvation despite sin not even named among the Gentiles. He says to hand this man over to Satan, his suffering should and it hopefully will be enough to cause, to cause him to want to return to the flock of God, meaning the church here. Should he continue in his sin, though, the only person he can blame for whatever happens in his life is him. God's hand of protection and comfort is removed, and fellowship with the brethren has ended, all because of the unhealthy choices he or she has made. A few verses later, Paul concludes his writing, chapter 5, with these words. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside, but those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. That's a reference to Deuteronomy 17, 7. This man, despite his faithless walk, despite what he is doing, is termed inside. He is a part of the body of Jesus Christ, and he is being judged now so that his soul, his eternally saved soul, will be redeemed on the day of Christ Jesus. This pertains particularly today to saved believers in Jesus Christ. And that's who I've been speaking to. People who have come to the cross and understand the work that Jesus Christ did on their behalf. And not are we only saved now, but we are saved for all eternity. Not because we deserve it or can deserve it through works, but because the mercy of God is. It simply is. Now there is a flip side to mercy, and that is wrath. God does not get angry at sin. God is angry at sin. And we are, by nature, sinful creatures. And therefore, we are, by nature, children of God's wrath. The Bible says as much in Ephesians chapter 2. But God does a great work in a person when he calls on the name of Jesus. He removes the wrath and he gives us eternal life. We become children. God. And the, it is so simple. It is so absolutely simple. Now, how do I know that? Because God even saved me. Here it is. Jesus lived the perfect life. Jesus gave up his life in exchange for mine. If I accept what Jesus did, then I am saved. It's that simple. And the result is eternal. No works required. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. The word here, obey, is synonymous in this context with the word believe. If we simply believe, then we will be promised the assurance of eternal life through Jesus. So I would ask you to call on the name of Jesus and receive his gift. And if you fall short someday in the future, God already knew you would. Don't worry about it. Just live for the Lord, confess your sin, and understand that his arms are sufficient to save you. They are infinitely strong. Now, I'm done here, but if anybody has never called on the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'm going to stand right down here while they're finishing up today. I'm going to sit down first, but when the service ends, I'm going to stand down here. And if you want to understand how simple it is to call on the name of Jesus and you'd like to talk about that, come up here and talk to me. If I go into there to talk to people after the sermon, you may not want to talk to me in front of 50 people. But I will be down here for anybody that wants to learn how to give their life to Jesus Christ, this wonderful God who united with human flesh, lived the perfect life that Charlie Garrett could never live, and then went to the cross of Calvary to pay the sin debt that I owed, an immense sin debt, an infinite sin debt compared to an infinite creator. So please, I invite you to come down and talk to me.